So we're moving on to the next topic now, which is uh, recruitment. And the keynote is, is Andre Punt, and the commenter is John Hampton. Okay, so, why can't I find it? I've been having issues with sharing recently. I'm not good at sharing anyway, as you well know. Um, let me try that again. I can see the file, it's just not, it's not with me. I'm going to stop my video. Yes, I can do that. Okay, let's try that again. That should be better. You should be able to see my slides now. Uh, what can yes, you see? We see it, um, but it's not in full screen yet. Okay, I think it's in full screen. <laughs> well, you must be um, sharing the wrong thing. I've been doing that very recently. Uh, Zoom. Com okay, let's yes. try this again. Let me. Okay, let me do that, and then Zoom is playing with me right now. Okay, stop sharing. Yes. Sorry, guys. I usually have two screens so I can see what I'm doing. What can you see now? Um, the same thing. It's not the full screen yet. Okay. I have no idea. Yeah. Can you hear me yes, now? That's good. Yep. I have no idea what I did, um, but it did throw me out for a second. So um, just so you know, <laughs> greetings from Perth, Western Australia, where it is 5.30 in the morning. Um, and I'm teaching a stock synthesis class, so I, I can identify with you guys. But um, I'm actually, on my, the Wi-Fi here is, is pathetic. Um, so I'm actually on my phone. So um, you've got a recording, right, Mark, in case it all falls over? Yes, I think so. <laughs> I gave it to you. You should have it. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that the, the, the Wi-Fi will stay up, but if it doesn't, well, I apologize. But then I can't apologize because I would have been cut off. Um, yeah, so first thing, I'd, I'd love to be there. Um, the meeting looks really exciting, but unfortunately, um, uh, the Star Trek uh, transporter isn't working between Perth and uh, New Zealand right now. I think it's the New Zealand effect, but who knows. Um, okay, so um, I am going to give an overview of um, really some perspectives rather than anything too deep uh, on uh, recruitment uh, with a focus on tuna fisheries, recognizing that I don't consider myself as uh, tuna oriented as you guys are quite clearly, and with an, uh, a focus on um, some tentative uh, best practices and good practices that hopefully you will all disagree with violently um, or not you know, violently, but you'll disagree with, and that will evoke some discussion about um, how we model recruitment, particularly with a focus on, on tuna fisheries. Uh, so I just got to make a note here. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So hopefully, my, let's get rid of myself. That's always good. Okay. So let's just step back a moment and um, think about why are we doing this? Um, and, um, you know, when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking that there are essentially three places that we use or need to think about recruitment. And each of them actually has quite different challenges. Um, and so the three are listed there. So basically, you know, how do we estimate recruitment? Um, and particularly, where does the stock crew relationship come into this? Um, uh, you know, how does recruitment itself is obviously critical to estimating absolute abundance um, and then uh, reference points. And I guess I would add to that uh, projections. Now, um, unlike some of the other things that you're probably hearing about, stock and recruitment is in one sense, one of the easier things to do, uh, at least in age structured stock assessments, because you can track recruitments and age data. Uh, but the stock root relationship itself is challenging, in particular, because in most cases, and I give some examples down in the bottom here that 
really, you know, it's very hard to detect the parameters, to estimate the parameters of the stock crude relationship, little, and in some cases, even detect the shape of the stock crude relationship. For stocks, for many stocks, at least fish stocks, we're starting to see things like uh, changes over time in recruitment in, in the stock crude relationship. Obviously, there's always variability in recruitment. Um, for uh, actual estimation, another problem that's pretty common is when you estimate the stock crude relationship, depending on the day of the week, you might hit the bound, I'm thinking of a Bevan and Holt here, of one or 0.2, just depending on what you've got. And if you look at that Peruvian anchovy at the bottom there, bottom right panel, you will see a stock crude relationship, um, if you believe that line, that essentially is a steepness of, of 0.2, suggesting there's essentially no compensation. And then we need to think about forecasting. So um, just to take a, a slightly more deeper think about um, tuna fisheries, obviously what I just showed you is pertinent to any assessment. Uh, what makes recruitment more difficult in your assessments is that your data are not age composition data generally. I recognize that they're often some age data, but not really at the level that you would expect in an age structured assessment. And you're essentially inferring uh, recruitment from changes primarily in length composition and dare I say weight composition, which is even less informative. Um, as I understand it, you know, most of the data, most of the assessments get data starting in the 1970s and some of the assessments go back well before that. So the question is, what do you do about early recruitments? And uh, I think tuna fisheries fall in the category of extreme lack of information about the stock crude relationship. Well, I just heard a funny ping. I hope that's not a bad sign. So hopefully you're still hearing me. Um, yes, so, we still hear you. Excellent. Um, so uh, I want to put up this quote just because I love it so much. There's a quote by John Shepard, um, who I just got a LinkedIn. I don't know how that happened, but I got LinkedIn saying he's been now working in Southampton for 29 years now, which is shocking. Uh, but he made the quote, um, and I, I, you know, I've always taken this as sort of an axiom of good fisheries management, is you don't want to know what the stock crude relationship is. So the real only way to find out what a stock crude relationship looks like is to pleat the stock. Um, so with that in mind, um, I just I can't remember what assessment this is anymore. Um, I, my brain is completely SS fried at the moment. Um, the one thing that we do have in tuna fisheries is actually quite a lot of data. Um, so the, this tuna fisheries, and I'm thinking particularly, you know, yellowfin, big eye, albacore, um, uh, tend to be what I would call data rich, but often information poor. Um, so we're in we're in a category where we've got lots of information, but potentially not much information about the things we care about, and, and that certainly is the case for for recruitment. So, uh, what am I going to talk about today? Um, so the, the five questions that I put posed myself when I when I was asked to give this talk are, you know, how do we struck how do we estimate recruitment? Uh, what stock recruit relationship? How do we decide which recruitments to estimate? What does it all mean for projections and risk analyses? And what about uncertainty? And hopefully I'll touch on all of those um, as, I, as I move through this presentation. So let's really um, uh, step back again a little bit and recognize that uh, these are integrated models and essentially uh, the assumptions you make um, regarding, uh, for example, growth, uh, initial age structure, et cetera, will have influence on both the estimates of recruitment as well as the uh, stock route relationship. So um, I think, I, I, you know, I'm, it, it's clearly a great way to organize a meeting around several topics, but I think uh, we need to recognize that these are not independent discussions. And what you do uh, in one area will pop up in another. And I'm sure Mark is going to talk about his famous recruitment regime shift, um, which um, for many people is a function of making the wrong assumption somewhere else in the assessment. Um, and then, of course, there's issues about spatiality and seasonal assessments, and I'll talk briefly about those as well. But really just to emphasize the importance of putting recruitment in context. So um, I, I saw an email from uh, Mark this morning, yesterday morning, um, essentially summarizing the options used in some tuner assessments. Um, uh, but I, what I did was I asked a whole bunch of people, and thank you for, to those people who replied, to send me the sort of most recent assessments of the sort of tune, the main tuner assessments. And I went through them and I sort of tried to do a mini meta analysis or really literature survey of what are the assumptions being made when uh, conducting assessments, uh, what sort of stock truth relationship, what about steepness, are you doing bias correction, et cetera. 
uh, you know, what is the process, what, what's the process for selecting which re recruitments to estimate and what about nasty things like spatial effects? Uh, I didn't get into Jabber because really that doesn't estimate recruitment. Um, and I really just use the, the assessments based on synthesis and multifan. Um, that did lead to a first recommendation. Um, and that's that red text at the bottom. Um, Mark's table was very helpful. If I'd had it when I was doing this, I wouldn't have had to email all you. Uh, but I thought that it, IOTC probably was best in terms of documenting what they actually did. Um, the assessments make a lot of assumptions. And, and if you're a naive you, reader, which obviously I was at the time, it's very hard to detect what the, the, the models are actually assuming for many of the specifications, some of which probably most people don't care about. But good luck to IOTC for, for doing this really well. So I'll use this meta-analysis as I move through the, through the talk. So this is an equation I gave at the CAPM recruitment workshop a number of years ago. I think it was in um, Miami, but I may be wrong. Um, and I'm going to use this as the focus for my discussion. So the idea here is that recruitment you know, I, in an ideal and complicated situation depends on sex, year, area, quarter, et cetera. And it is a function of the stock route relationship uh, itself. Um, and I note here that I've left out area dependence. Uh, sex ratio, spatial distribution, and seasonal allocation. Now, you don't need to worry too much about whether I included T's and Q's and all this stuff in here, but essentially these are the four factors that uh, really determine um, how your model is going to operate. You need to think about all of these four options when you're uh, dealing with recruitment. Um, and before I get too deep into the structural thing, um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of uh, issues, which again, I'll get into in more detail, and that is you know, how do we deal with stochasticity and recruitment, particularly in spatial models? Um, again, I think this is an area of, of research, um, but whether you estimate a time invariant split of recruitment spatially or not is something that will obviously affect the results. And I, as far as I can see, the, the few spatial assessments that I, I looked at seem to do this quite differently. Um, the other thing I'd like to raise here, which I didn't see in any of the uh, assessments is uh, essentially forcing uh, spatial autocorrelation in some of the recruitment deviations. And, and that's something that I, I think is an area for future research. So let's immediately go into um, the form of the stock route relationship. So um, when I looked at those assessments, almost all of them assume a Bevan and Holt stock route relationship without ever justifying why. Uh, steepness is uh, fixed for. Uh, every assessment I saw um, with a range of 0.7 to 1. Um, and why do I care about this? Well, um, I noticed that a lot of assessments are now reporting FMSY and uh, the stock size at, at, um, at MSY. That's all very good. But if you fix steepness, you're essentially fixing those parameters. And this is a plot on the right-hand side from a paper by Bill Clark, now 20-odd years old, uh, but highlighting the real sensitivity of those reference points to steepness. So what you assume about steepness has a, a direct bearing on those, on those reference points. And there's definitely inconsistency among assessments in terms of what range of steepness is looked at without any clear justification. So um, what I'm going to do here is, is, and I'm going to do this for each of the topics I'm touching, is what, what do I consider to be good practices in this regard? Um, I would advocate that if you're producing reference points, particularly things like B over BMSY, um, that you consider both the Ricker and the Beverton Holt stock route relationship. And, and part of that is that um, often it doesn't matter what stock route relationship you put in in terms of estimating historical recruitment, but it has this dramatic effect on reference points and projections. I'm always a fan of um, estimating uh, steepness because that allows the uncertainty to um, be propagated. And I, I think assessments should at least look at trying to do that, obviously with a prior that's based on uh, some form of meta-analysis. Um, and obviously if, you know, um, uh, if the other, if, if, you know, if that doesn't work, you, you should be looking at uh, scenarios. So um, this was something that actually came, the first that dot point came out of our CAPM Good Practices Workshop a couple of months ago. Um, this is going to be a challenge for those who use SS, but if you're concerned about time varying productivity, we should really be moving back to the old alpha beta parameterization from the steepness um, parameterization. 
In terms of steepness, if you want to keep it, I would suggest that this meeting could be an, a catalyst for coming up um, with a common set of taxon specific steepness values. So if you're doing albacore assessments, you should really be doing the same scenarios uh, if you're going to fix them for, for steepness. And, and I'm, there's still quite a bit of inconsistency in, in steepness values. The other thing, and I was sort of shocked to see this, is very few stock assessments, tuna stock assessments, actually plot stock versus recruitment. What you see is what I've got on the right-hand side here. So these are the rec devs. Uh, but you don't see whether there's any evidence for a spawner recruit relationship in the assessment report. Now, maybe that's done in the background analyses, but um, I'm a great fan of seeing you know, what, what, what's, what's actually going on and, and is there any evidence visually for, for a stock recruit relationship. So uh, let's now talk about the deviations about the stock recruit relationship a bit more. I talked about spatial aspects of that. Um, but again, looking at the assessments, this is not a tuner assessment. Uh, but what I um, what I noticed was that most assessments don't estimate the entire set of recruitment deviations, um, and almost no assessment documents why they chose their specific um, uh, their specific choice. So why did you choose 1975 to 2020 or whatever it was? Um, and and I found that to be sort of troublesome generally, um, and would advocate again. Um, sort of a, a best practices to be developed in this regard, and I'll, I'll suggest something. Um, secondly, um, all the assessments pre-specified sigma r with a huge range, uh, 0.3 to 1 uh, within a single taxon. I can't remember what it is anymore, but it was definitely um, very variable. And where is this relevant? Uh, usually not very relevant for estimating uh, recruitments when you've got good data, but very important when you're projecting. Uh, if you are going to do projections. And most assessments, um, not the multi-fan CL ones, but the, um, uh, the SS ones all had some form of time varying bias correction. So um, as I've sort of already touched on, um, the comments I want to make here in terms of good practices, things for discussion, or I think for this meeting could be used partially to come up with a, um, a best practice terms of reference for which recruitments to estimate, particularly the past ones, if, if your model starts before your data become effective. Um, I My preference is always to estimate more recruit deeds than fewer. Uh, and the reason for that is twofold. One, um, it allows uncertainty be, to be propagated, but also um, it encourages you to do Bayesian analyses where that is actually more feasible than these penalized maximum likelihood things we, we tend to use a bit. The second is sigma r. Um, don't estimate it. Um, uh, if you do try to estimate it, uh, it'll be negatively biased. Um, and I did some simulations for the Kaplan workshop in October that showed that even in a state space formulation, when your data are primarily length based, you also end up with negatively biased estimates of sigma r. So um, be, be very careful here. But again, I think there's a basis for coming up with a, a set of good practices for what assessment should consider. And then, um, uh, and again, uh, this may be done, but it wasn't documented in many of the assessment reports, is uh, applying the, bi the, the bias ramp approach of Mathot and Taylor that allows the, the, the bias correction, um, that B in the equation at the top of the slide, changes as a function of time uh, and reflects the um, uncertainty in the rec dev. So uh, low B when you've got poorly estimated rec devs and full bias correction or close to full bias correction when you've got um, well estimated rec devs. Sorry, I'm going to sip a coffee here. Uh, this is where I usually make my usual comment, Mark, about you and your paper that published a, a local minimum, um, but I have to do it because I, I, I feel I have to. Um, so Estimating sigma r uh, is it seems like a good thing to do. Unfortunately, uh, the estimate is going to be biased if you used penalized likelihood, which of course we do. Um, you can estimate it within a, a state space model or Bayesian analysis, but you can't estimate it within um, within the context of a, um, a a normal penalized likelihood method. Um, the other thing I'd like to note, I'll drop to the third point here, is I, I think we need to be spending more time thinking about autocorrelation in uh, historical and future recruit deeds. I didn't see that uh, to be considered 
um, in any of the assessments. There's a paper by Kelly Johnson, which suggests that that autocorrelation should actually be estimated outside of the assessment. So don't try to estimate it inside the assessment for the same reasons that sigma r is inestimable. Talking now about bias ramps, um, as I said before, if you've got a random effects model or a Bayesian model, you don't need to worry about this, the rampy side of things. Um, and I always use essentially the approach in, in stock synthesis, which uh, uh, sets zero bias correction when you've got no data. And you can see that in this plot on the right-hand side where some of the early devs and the rate, later devs have uh, very high standard errors. So you wouldn't give a, a large bias correction there. I think it does. It can make quite a difference to estimates of historical abundance. So it, it should be part of our good practices. Um, what was I going to say here? Oh, right. Um, Sigma R, again, is something we need to think about, and um, I've done some very preliminary work here, and it does suggest that getting Sigma R wrong actually affects things we do care about, like R0 and B0, and obviously hence reference points. Um, I um, tend to go um, to, to avoid the uh, recruitments being driven by the stock group relationship. So sometimes I would advocate that you have a high sigma R when you're estimating recruit DEVs, but in fact, when you forecast, you use more, more realistic values. So running now on to time varying parameters. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of work done on whether uh, there are regime shifts uh, in recruitment for tuna species, obviously, marks the yellow fin mark, is that the one, or was it a big eye, I can't remember, um, shows what could be a regime shift. Uh, but work done by Cody Suzwalski and others has suggested that regime shifts are very common in um, estimates of recruitment, particularly based on age structure models. Um, and I note that there is quite a lot of use in um, um, tuner assessments of the dynamic B0 approach, which I have to say I have a slight, um, I'm ambivalent about the value of dynamic B0 in a management context. But again, we can talk about that. Um, that said, um, at least in the US, uh, reference points should be based on environment, current environmental, um, prevailing environmental and, and ecological conditions. Um, but what I'm seeing both in tuna fisheries, uh, but more importantly, in, in not importantly, more specifically in invertebrate and teleost fisheries, is that people are calling regime shifts without really any established protocol. So for several years now, and in several fora, I've been pushing for the idea that the community really does need to come up with an approach that allows us to decide when do we allow things like R0 to change between regimes. And there's a paper by Neil Clare from 2013, uh, which outlined an approach, but 2013 is 10 years ago, and I would hope that we could, we could update that. Um, there are two basic ways to estimate uh, recruitment, uh, if you're going to link it to the environment. Um, uh, I, have, I didn't see a lot of that in the, the tuner assessments. I'm at a, this meeting I'm at at the moment um, uh, on stock synthesis is really emphasizing that in many cases, people are concerned and interested in, in bringing environmental covariates into either the stock root relationship, which I call the covariate approach, or as an index of the recruitment deviations, which is the so-called data approach. Now, touching on spatial models, um, the, there, there are a number of those, um, particularly in the Indian Ocean and uh, the models done by SPC. Um, what I noticed there was I didn't see a, um, a protocol had been applied to decide which spatial deviations uh, to apply in different assessments. And it looked like there was a, that, you know, it seemed to be very case specific, uh, which, you know, which different authors with different philosophies. And I think, again, for this meeting, it'd be good for you guys to talk about protocols for, you know, how do you establish best practices for which spatial deviations to, to estimate? And it, uh, in, in my opinion, um, there, there is some work in this area. Uh, Aaron Berger, Aaron, are you in the audience? I don't, I can't see anybody, so I don't know. Um, Aaron's written a really good uh, paper, will write a very good paper on spatial assessments and best practices there, and I, I'd suggest that that be integrated into your discussions. Um, that said, I think um, the, the things that I particularly pulled out from what I what I found was, um, you know, what in principle some areas and seasons shouldn't have recruitment. Uh, we know that from 
you know, auxiliary information, but documenting that and using that when selecting the choices for rec devs, I think is, is important. And also dealing with temporal um, and spatial autocorrelation in, in devs. Estimation framework, I'm getting near the end, I think. Um, usually I have two screens, so I know that, but today I don't. Um, so um, I've been harping on this for a long time. I don't know if Anders Nielsen is in the audience, but he would nod knowingly that he agrees with me on this. And that is uh, many of our assessments, or all of our assessments are based on penalized likelihood. And as I've emphasized before, that leads to biased estimates or no estimates of sigma r. Uh, moving to a state space model, particularly one with ages, um, it's much more um, difficult with length data. One can then actually estimate sigma r, which is a key parameter in both uh, his historical and future projections. Um, for time reasons, I'm going to skip over this and just really emphasize that um, the key difference between our current estimation approach and uh, state space model is that we are forced to guesstimate or tune our sigma r parameters and our bias ram parameters moving to a state space model uh, would allow that to, to no longer be the case. Um, diagnostics, I'm not going to talk much about these because um, there's a separate section in your meeting, uh, but there was a really good paper that came out a couple of weeks or months ago uh, essentially looking at uh, recruitment deviations and whether they look random, because that's essentially what you're assuming. Uh, this is actually from Southern Blue from Tuna. Um, there's these the rec devs. These are pretty, to me, to my eye, this does not look like um, IID um, re recruitment deviations. So something is, um, something is peculiar here, and, and that probably requires a little bit more thought. Um, but I don't think we've really, as a field, spent much time saying, um, are, you know, are our recruitment deviations random, which is what we're, we're assuming. So moving on to projections, um, obviously, uh, for some of you, you're doing projections, but not many of you, not all of you. Um, uh, if you're going to do projections, you really do need to have a stock truth relationship. Otherwise, why are you bothering? Because if steepness equals one, then you can get down to half a tuner and you'll rebuild to B0. Um, when I've looked at some of those assessments, um, I'm not seeing that all the uncertainty, particularly things like spatial variability and recruitment are being projected forward. Um, and I'd like to use this time to, to have a plug for the AD nuts package. So this is um, a package developed primarily by Cole Monaghan. Um, that applies the nuts algorithm. It works really well for stock synthesis. I've now managed to get um, nuts to work for three or four assessments quite effectively and estimating parameters like sigma r. Uh, some of my work, and, and I'm guessing most of you will get there or if you're not there already, is uh, projections into the future under different environmental conditions. And I've got a plot here, it's an oldie, it's from Teresa Amar's PhD, uh, where we forecasted a model, um, a Bayesian model, if I remember correctly, forward under different um, uh, Earth system models, uh, some of which I think have gone to the wayside now. But um, the basic principle is that it's a key, the, the environmental driver can be a key uh, driver of the projections. So some final issues, I'm going to touch on three things that I would have liked to have really talked about in more detail. Um, the first is if you're doing a stock synthesis assessment, you're generally assuming, um, well, you are assuming that density dependence is global. So it doesn't matter where a tuna is spawned in the Indian Ocean, uh, density dependence occurs at some magical um, area that all tuna can get to and, and hence interact. So uh, one of the places we need to start thinking about is uh, if we actually have multiple demographic units, uh, how do we how do we model those other than the current approach, which essentially is a single a single population with spatial substructure? And I'd point to Gadget as as a package that actually allows some of that. I think so does Castle too, but I'm not completely sure. Data poor cases. I wish I'd had time to talk about data poor. Um, my current um, approach is really to emphasize that rather than um, use simple or data poor stock assessments, that we take our, our standard approaches and essentially um, uh, recognize that there is uncertainty. So this is a plot on the right hand side, something from Jason Cope. Uh, emphasizing uh, some of that is that essentially uh, when you have data poor situations, you should quantify higher uncertainty. And, and I've certainly seen cases where people have gone from a data poor method to a data rich method and the uncertainty has actually gone up, which suggests that the uncertainty is poorly estimated. 
Finally, I, I'm not even going to talk about sex-specific recruitment. I don't think you guys deal with it very much, but should you? So final slide, I think. Um, uh, some, just some best practice and good practices. I, I think it's okay to use a Bevan and Holt and fix steepness, but ultimately I think we should be looking at multiple stock roots relationships and try to estimate as many parameters as possible. Uh, we should be using uh, random effects models or state space models for both the recruit D reasons and for sigma R. And hopefully if we do that, we can end up in the bottom right corner here where we don't need to worry as much about bias ramps uh, as we do now. And with that, I will point out uh, where I had a beer last night. Um, I was sitting, uh, there's no, no one sitting on the top left corner of that uh, breakwater, but I was there last night having a very nice beer looking out over the, uh, the bay. And uh, I'm somewhere, well, I'm not actually there now, but I could be having my coffee uh, at one of those restaurants on the waterfront. So uh, with that, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Wellington is looking just as beautiful and blue skies as it is in Perth. Thanks. I will stop sharing. Oh my goodness, I look like a... <laughs> Thanks, Andre. I guess it's early in the morning over there, right? Um, any questions for Andre? Yeah, Nicholas. Yeah, Andre, thanks. Um, you mentioned moving to a mixed effects approach would allow us to estimate sigma r, but you also showed that when we predominantly, predominantly have length compositions, that might be negatively biased. So I'm curious, should we estimate it and simply be wary of this if we're going to a mixed effects approach? Or, or what are your um, thoughts on, on good practices there? Yeah, I, I, as I was saying that, I was going, hmm, this doesn't seem very consistent with what I just said. Um, so, you know, firstly, you're, you're spot on. I mean, if, you, um, if, you, if you've got primary length data and you don't have much uh, conditional age at length data, which obviously is the case for, for tuna fisheries, you are going to get negative bias. But, I, I, you know, my, my view still is that it is better to uh, put the model in a state space model, estimate it, and then, as you say, take into account that you've probably got some negative bias, but at least you've got a point estimate that's not completely nonsense, which is when I looked at the different assessments, there was I could not work out how sigma R was set for most of those assessments. So at least it provides a first base from which to, to make your arguments. But yeah, yeah, certainly a fair point that I was a little inconsistent there. Okay. Oh, you want to respond? Just else? a brief follow-up. Is that is that problem persistent in a Bayesian framework as well? Um, is that I don't I've never looked at that. My guess is that it depends on the priors, but I'm I'm guessing it's you what you see in simulations anyway is when you fit length comp data, you tend to do a lot more shrinkage. You don't you don't pick up the big year classes because you know, I tend to see length data as like age data with a lot of aging error. And we know that when we estimate rec devs with aging error and ignore it, it tends to, to do shrinkage. So you'd expect negative bias. Okay. But I think that's a, that's a great question. And I'm sure there's a student out there who's desperate to get an extra chapter. <laughs> okay. Any other comments on that particular topic? Yeah, Rich. Thanks, Andre. Oh, geez, sorry. Um, do you have any comments on how the misspecification of the penalty and the recruitment deviates really plays into when you're trying to estimate steepness? Like, I'd, it's not always clear really how much information you're really getting from the, the stock recruit penalty and how much that can dominate the steepness. And if you misspecify specifically, the, the plot you came up from SBT is the one I'm talking about, is yep. if you don't factor in the level of autocorrelation and structure in the deviates, you're getting all your information on steepness from the fact that you misspecified your recruitment deviates. And when you account for it, it really flattens out. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, I don't, I don't know of anyone who's looked at that in detail, but as a, as a sort of first order comment, that's exactly right. So, um, you know, some, I, I'm, I'm always a little skeptical, even though I was an author of the paper about a lot of these papers that detect regime shifts and my, my concern is what they're really detecting is autocorrelation uh, interpreted within, within the context of independent observation. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I would say, and, and maybe you're going to say you guys have done that. I was hoping you're in the audience so you could respond. Um, you know, the first order is basically take into account the autocorrelation before you worry about estimating the stock root relationship. And, you know, in your case, you've either got something misspecified, um, 
or there's uh, you know some unknown environmental variable that's driving those rec devs. But you know clearly you 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 you're right. You'd be you need to be very careful if you then fit a stock recruit relation relationship to the the, rec, the recruitments you're getting out of that because uh, the epsilons are are, are going to be misinterpreted. Okay, Rich, do you wanna? Yeah, that that's sort of what we tried to do was to look at essentially post hoc. Once you've de autocorrelated the residuals and you look at the relative weights that you would actually get on the steepness, it really flattens out. So mm -hmm. it's it's just an artifact. And one thing we did once, because there was this argument versus regime versus autocorrelation, was create like a 10 by 10 panel of what a, a sequence of recruitment deviates would look like for the given autocorrelation and variance you see. And then just get people to visually say, wow, some of those you'll see 10 years above or below. And you're like, wow, I'd think that's a regime. I said, no, that's just coming from an autocorrelated process. Yep. You're, yep. Just, yep. You're, no. I, you're visually eyeing in on it. You're visually regressing, but that's not what it is. Exactly. Um, yeah. You, you, yeah. I, again, I, I, I simplified quite a few things that need to be done, um, you know, obviously properly. And, um, you know, to be honest, visual regime shift checking is definitely not best practice. <laughs> But okay. extremely common because um, I, I don't know about anybody else in the room, but one of the things I do in my classes is I randomly generate data sets, just random, you know, random uniform, not one, and just plot them against each other and give them a name like, you know, temperature and, uh, you know, whatever it is, impact of uh, fishing on MPAs and let people come up with hypotheses. And it's amazing how many people can come up with deep, meaningful hypotheses from random data. Okay, I think we better move on to the next speaker, um, but we'll have a discussion after that so we can bring this back up again if we want. And I know I need yeah, to I really like you me. guys to, to talk about this idea of best practices for things like ranges of parameters. So that, that really did stick out for me anyway. Yeah. Of course, I'm leaving the meeting at whenever it is and you can ignore me. <laughs> Okay, but we we are going to have a discussion a bit later on, so hopefully you can stay here for that. Um, John Hampton is our next presenter. He's going to give a comment. Um, John, can you share your screen and can you hear us? Okay, and, yeah. thanks, Mark. I shall try and do that. Okay, you're coming through nice and clearly, so that's good. Okay. Apologies for the background noise. Um, lots of bird life here on Bribey Island, where I'm currently recovering from a knee replacement. Okay. Um, yep, that came out more good, thanks. Okay, so you can see that, okay. Okay, so what I decided to do in um, this presentation is to just highlight a few points regarding recruitment that uh, seem to have come up pretty consistently over the years in assessments that I've um, been involved with. Hang on, I'm just trying to work out how to progress this. Okay. The, um, some of the issues that have come up pretty consistently over the years in, in assessments that I've been uh, involved with or that have been um, undertaken at SPC. Um, and they fall into these categories. The firstly, the specification and estimation um, of the stock recruitment relationship, the structure of the recruitment estimation, and the third point, uh, which has been a bit of a hairy one over years, what happens when you estimate strong trends in recruitment? So going through each of these, um, as Andre said uh, on a number of occasions, that in our typical tuna assessments, the stock recruitment relationship uh, can't really be estimated internally. And so, uh, you know, while best practice may be to estimate all the parameters, this is not going to be generally possible for tuna. Now, just as a thought experiment on that, I took a look at the 2022 Skipjack stock assessment and did a, a quick uh, likelihood profile on steepness. And when you look at the plot, um, you might think, oh, yeah, there's, there's, there's information there and, you know, you can estimate steepness in, in this assessment. But two things, the, the, the best likelihood occurs at what most people would think of as a biologically implausible value around 0.36, so very little uh, compensation. Um, but if you can see the scale on the y-axis, you'll see that the changes in the log likelihood 
um, across that big range of steepness are trivially small in the sort of one hundredths of a, of a likelihood unit. So I, I think from that we can we can pretty much say that there's uh, no information on the data in this assessment on which you can estimate uh, steepness. Now, of course, in this in this assessment, again, um, I think in common with other assessments, steepness is important because it impacts uh, the interpretation and, and estimation of reference points. So I just plotted out some of the reference point estimates uh, across the range of steepness. Um, in particular, the uh, the spawning biomass over spawning biomass at MSY, which is the orange, is uh, very strongly impacted by the assumed level of steepness, um, as is uh, the MSY itself, uh, particularly at low levels of steepness. The depletion estimators um, are, are a little more robust, but um, it's a little bit hidden on the scale that that's been plotted. So there is still some dependency on, on steepness. So, you know, one way or the other, we still have to um, deal with uncertainty in um, in steepness in our assessments for this region, a reason because we're, we're normally required to report uh, stock status on the basis of these reference points, at least some of them. Um, so what do we do here, given that we can't really estimate steepness? Um, so I would tend to advocate that, um, you know, an alternative best or good practice would be, as I've said there, to, um, to capture uncertainty by running multiple models with fixed steepness, either sample from a realistic probability distribution, you know, perhaps based on some sort of meta-analysis, if, if one can reasonably independently do that, or with values selected over a realistic range and appropriately weighted. So that's the sort of thing that we've tended to do in our assessments at SPC now for some years is to, is to take this model ensemble approach um, and include steepness as one of the, um, the uncertainty dimensions in, in, in that ensemble. Um, so the structure of recruitment estimation, it's uh, a little interesting to dive a little bit more deeply in that. I certainly agree with Andre's proposals for best and good practice regarding the estimation of, of all of the deviates. <clears throat> I guess the small wrinkle in, in that when you get into some of these large models is that estimating all of the the DEVs, and we, we usually have year, season, and in our spatial assessments also area, uh, can result in a large number of parameters. So sticking with the, the skipjack example, we have 50 years, four seasons, eight, eight areas. So that, that can result in 1,600 recruitment DEV parameters um, or thereabouts to be estimated. So even though you can constrain that estimation with priors um, of various sorts on those DEVs, I think there's still um, a risk of over-parameterization. And that motivated Dave Fournier, who's you know the key developer of Multifan CL some years ago, to, to look at an approach that he termed the orthogonal polynomial recruitment. And essentially what what what, what this is is to is to to try to develop a, a functional form for the the way in which recruitment varies um, in in different ways over time. So you can think of it as, as a similar thing that you know with selectivity we don't try and estimate a selectivity for every size class, but we we have a, a functional form to try and summarize that parameterization in in a more tractable way. So this polynomial orthogonal polynomial recruitment process, we attempt to break down um, year, season, area, and season area interactions in a structured way, and we use uh, polynomials to, of, of, of some degree to restrict the time series variability. So as an example of that for Skipjack, we would specify a high order polynomial, say, say 40 for the year effect, a single seasonal effect, for example. Um, so just using the average seasonal effect um, and keeping that constant over time for each region. And a, and a moderate area effect so that you, you do allow the, the area allocation of recruitment to vary um, slowly over time. And if we used a coefficient of 10, that would result in, as I say down there in total, only 74 parameters. Um, so 
that, that that's probably an alternative approach that we can think about in in cases where we're struggling to get biologically plausible estimates of recruitment when we're estimating all of these um, you know sometimes more than a thousand recruitment div parameters. Um, in terms of sigma r, now uh, yeah, Andre pro made made proposals uh, estimation in a state space formulation as best practice um, or fixed based on meta analysis as as good practice. Um, I, I guess in terms of the assessments that SPC has been doing um, over the last decade or so, we were guided by a, a review in 2011 of our Big Eye Tuna stock assessment that Andre was involved in, also Jim and, and Mark, and the overall um, you know, recommendation from that with respect to Sigma R was that uh, we should set it such that the size of the stock recruitment penalty, which is directly related to Sigma R, should be selected, which allows the asymptote of the stock recruitment relationship to be estimated, but is otherwise uninformative about stock size. So we've been taking that approach. And as far as I'm aware, nobody else doing um, integrated assessments for tuna has been taking that approach. So we, we basically set sigma R to be as high as possible um, while still allowing us to get a reasonable estimate of R0. Um, so I, I guess it's a question for the meeting. Is, is that approach still reasonable or, or should we be using um, lower estimates of sigma R that are you know, based on a meta-analysis or, or generally agreed to be more appropriate for, for tuners. Um, the final point I'd just like to mention concerns trends in recruitment. Now, in, in many of our tuner assessments, we are estimating strong trends in recruitment. Sorry, it's a good coffee and recruitment divs. Um, showing these sorts of trends over time. So again, with the last skipjack assessment, we saw um, this is the estimated uh, pattern of, of recruitment. The DEVs would look pretty similar to that if, if I was to show them. Um, and of course, that creates a lot of interest when you're presenting these assessments and, and people tend to be uh, a bit uncomfortable when they see these trends and, and want to know why they're occurring. Now, one kind of reason that's that's often been put up is that the the models are simply responding to uh, increases and strong increases in catch over the period of the assessment and it's using increasing recruitment in order to predict those those uh, increases in in catch and and if that was you know hap happening in a kind of pathological way that that would be of considerable concern However, what we see also in, in skipjack and I, and I think in other tuna species as well is that the ocean's changing. We all know that it's been changing for some time. I'm just plotting here um, the area of the so-called Western Pacific warm pool, which is the area of ocean greater than 28.5 uh, degrees, roughly sort of comparable to skipjack spawning habitat. And we see how that's been expanding over time. So perhaps there are environmental reasons why we might see um, increases in recruitment over time. So the, the sorts of possibilities in interpreting this, I, I think, boil down to, to these um, alternatives. The trend is actually fake and as a model response as a model response to increasing catch. But then that implies that, um, you know, possibly the CPUE trends are wrong because the model is attempting to fit CPUE. It's, it's fitting catch exactly. And this is, is what comes out of it. The second possibility is that the trend is real, indicating a change in productivity over time. <clears throat> of course, you know, we would then need to think about what changes in stock recruitment relationship and, and how we model that within the assessment we would need to make in order to accommodate productivity change. Do we need to, to have some sort of time, time varying um, R0, for example? Um, the third possibility is that, and I think Andre also touched on this, is that there's a change in, in the dynamics 
um, in one of the other areas of the model, such as the reduced natural mortality for juveniles that might have occurred because of the large decreases in predator abundance over time. But in our assessments, of course, M is assumed to be temporarily stable and changing recruitment is therefore really the only way that the model could respond given that M is fixed to, to be constant. So just to, to sort of summarize um, those points, in, in most tuna assessments, uh, the internal estimation of steepness won't be possible. So I guess um, we can consider a multi-model approach that captures the uncertainty and steepness, potentially other parameters also that need to be specified and, and have that as a part of our, our suite of, of good and best practice guidance. Um, secondly, estimation of all of the recruitment deviate parameters can possibly risk over parameterization. Uh, can we consider uh, methods to economize on parameters uh, through developing functional forms for recruitment variability over time, such as the polynomial recruitment structure that I, that I mentioned? And can we consider that also to be a, a part of, of good practice guidelines? Uh, the third point. Uh, just to, to reiterate, when choosing the value of sigma r, um, what we've been guided to do is to, to make sigma r as large as possible, still enabling the estimation of r zero, should we be, be doing it um, in, in another way. And fourthly, for estimated trends in recruitments, pretty common in most tuner assessments, um, if they're real, uh, we need to make a response probably in the, in the, uh, the way we're modelling the stock recruitment process. <clears throat> However, we need to spend more time, uh, I think, in, in better understanding why such trends uh, occur and, uh, you know, take appropriate action in terms of the, of the modelling in those cases. So that's uh, pretty much what I had, and I'll hand it back to Mark for any questions. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, does anyone have any questions for John on his presentation? Oh, my hand is up. Yeah, Andre has his hand up. Andre. Yeah, well, the good news is you're not going to have to endure me asking a lot of questions because I won't be here for much longer. Um, but thanks, John. I, you know, you and I are, I think, in agreement on most things. But I did have a, a couple of thoughts, and and maybe Mark and I can remember what we were talking about back in 2011. Um, so, I, you know, when we when I said estimate the parameters, I think what you did was exactly what I think we should be doing, which is making sure we look to see if there is data, uh, information about things like steepness in our data. And if not, what you did with a multi-model approach, essentially, if you've got um, no information on steepness, uh, a posterior for steepness is essentially a multi-model approach because you're not weighting the different steepness values. So I think that's totally consistent with, with where I think I'm coming from. But I think actually looking to see what the data says and taking Rich's point into account that you can actually end up with spurious information about steepness as well. So I uh, totally agree with that. Um, on the sigma r thing, I think where we were coming from, and Mark, you, you were there too, is there are two places where sigma r comes in and um the, the the there are sort of two sets of good practices so the one that we gave you was essentially the if you get steepness wrong in the assessment you don't want to bias the estimates of recruitment basically so if in that case high sigma r just puts a very weak prior on recruitments and it doesn't influence the estimates of recruitment where i was focusing on and perhaps i wasn't as clear is sigma r also has forecast implications. So if you use the biggest possible sigma r that you like, you're gonna get enormous uncertainty far outside the range of the estimates of, of, of recruit deep. So I would argue that if you know if you are cons if, if if you're worried that setting the stock recruit relationship is 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 impacting unnecessarily your recruitments, then what you what you're doing now is right. But if you are interested in forecast, then you need to think about a different value of sigma r because that otherwise you're going to be overestimating the, the, the recruitment deviations in the future. So that was the third, second one. The third one, I, I, this, the polynomial thing is intriguing to me. Um, and I guess my question is how much of this overparameterization is caused by the fact that we still use um, uh, penalized likelihood methods. So 
uh, I've had quite a lot of luck with using the nuts algorithm to estimate enormous numbers of random effects because essentially you're marginalize them, marginalizing them out. You're not sort of really focusing on the point estimate of the recruit deviation for area five in season one in 1943. Um, so I think it may be that, you know, some of the other parameterization issues can be resolved if we actually improve our, our estimation. But I recognize that multifan CL is not ready for random effect structure just right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Andre. Um, with that, we can yes. also move into general discussions too, but let's keep on the points that Andre brought up. Pamela. Just, just sorry, Mark, just to respond to one of Andre's points there. Um, in terms of sigma r and, and projections, um, at least in the way we do projections, we don't use the sigma r uh, for the, to, to generate stochastic recruitments into the future. We tend to sample from the estimated recruitment divs themselves. So hopefully we're not um, you know, biasing our projections by having a, an unduly high value of sigma r. Thanks, John. Pamela, you have a comment? Um, this uh, polynomial recruitment structure, which um, sounds really interesting, um, has, do you know if anyone has used it um, or if it's actually written up anywhere that's um, reasonably accessible? Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of the latter, unfortunately not yet. Um, we've, we've been using it more as a sort of an investigative tool uh, at the moment. Uh, we haven't used it um, sort of in anger in a production assessment at, the, at this point. Um, uh, and I think before we did that, we would certainly like to try to um, get it published and, and expose it to more scrutiny um, so that people can comment on it and, and, it's, and it's well documented. So, so not yet. Thanks, John. Uh, Simon? Yeah, I had a, a question about that polynomial recruitment um, approach as well. I was thinking that in, I get in a GLM or GAM types of analyses, when you use a, a polynomial, you tend to get um, bias towards the end of the, um, sort of towards the edges of the data because of the correlation along the polynomial, which is why people tend to use uh, splines instead of polynomials and those kinds of analyses. Um, could that kind of issue be occurring with recruitment estimates? And if it was, you might have biases at the, like in the most recent part of the time series. I'm just, could you comment on that, please? Yeah, I mean, we, I think there's this functionality in the way that this is specified so that you can, um, you know, not apply the um, the the polynomial function towards the extremes of the time series, so that they they can be sort of set to the average, if you will. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, take I take your point. There, there's certainly lots of things that need to be explored with this and and comparisons to be done. So hopefully, we can we can do that in the near future. Thanks, John. Um, Nicola, you have a comment. Yeah, thanks, John. I really like the overview of of recruitment and the issues they uh, talked about. Just a, a follow up comment on the orthogonal polynomial parameterization. It was something that was tested uh, somewhat extensively in the spatial simulation project for yellowfin, Indian Ocean yellowfin tuna, and one of the things that was found in that approach, given a if a fully saturated or close to fully saturated parameterization, kind of like what John described, is that in the periods of the model when you had a lot of information coming from other data sources, length, composition, CPUE, the orthogonal polynomial parameterization estimated recruitment deems to be really close to the completely uh, free estimation approach. But in the periods where there wasn't as much data, particularly earlier on in the model, you tended to get estimates that were very close to what would be estimated from uh, the mean of the stock recruit relationship. Um, so I, th I saw that as, as kind of a nice, a nice mm. trade off um, in being able to estimate um, or 
maybe constrain the estimation of recruits in, in parts of the model that you didn't have that much data from. So yeah, just a comment. Thanks. Any other comments on this particular topic? My hand is up. You're not paying attention, Dr. Mondo. Yeah, I see it there, Andre, but I, I like to give other people a chance to talk. <laughs> so, go, Andre. Ouch. So, Andre, you, you're the only one that wants to respond, so you have a chance. Yeah, just to follow up on Simon's point, I, I, we've been comparing uh, polynomial fits to, to essentially spatial devs and um, you know, best practice seems to be moving to these n-dimensional uh, splines. And the advantage there is you can be even more flexible in terms of where you put your knots. But I think at, you know the point about you'll end up with something very similar to what you would end up in da in data poor situation, data rich situations is that is certainly the test. Also, um, John, an invitation to submit a manuscript to Fisheries Research, and I've at least got two reviewers already for your paper, so that's brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. Anything else on this particular topic? No, I've, I've got a, a comment that's related to this. So some models use the quarters as years approach. Uh, other models use a seasonal approach. The spatial models have spatial things. So how does the Sigma R work there? Because a Sigma R on a quarterly basis is different than a sigma r on an annual basis and if you have a seasonal pattern then the signal sigma r around the seasonal pattern is different than the sigma r without the seasonal pattern so how do we deal with the fact that sigma r actually differs depending on other structures in the model especially if you're not estimating it any comments on that Yeah, Dan. Yeah, just quick comments. I think that difference was noticed by Dale Collard at some stage. I think he come up with some kind of relationship um, between those two sigma R with those two type of um, structure. I can't remember which is which. I think probably with a, if you use an annual model, then the sigma R should be, let's say, square root of the R sigma R divided by four, maybe the other way. Um, so I think at some stage when in our assessment, we did take into account of that kind of relationship when we try different model structure, but that doesn't seem to have much of a big impact. Um, but I think for most of our recent assessment, which is structured as quarter as year, we still use the sigma R of uh, open six. Um, yeah, but I think that's uh, that's probably an issue that should be given more consideration. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, Carolina. So, uh, question for for everybody: When we do the uh, the likelihood profile on R zero, so the the absolute scale, sometimes we have a very large um, effect of the recruitment penalties right so andre saying we shouldn't have a, a cv or that that could um, interfere in the scale right in estimating the scale so should we look for this diagnostics and try to find like a flat line for this for this component this penalty component or what should we do So, Andre, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about this to that extent, but I have to say that the point Carolina raises is deeply disturbing, that you think that the most information you have on a scale is a penalty you put in for convenience, basically. Um, so the, the, the approach certainly that we advocated uh, apparently uh, to John many years ago with a high sigma r at least that will flatten out the the the, the, the penalty on recruitment in the r0 profile so you'll really be seeing what in the data are telling you about r0 rather than some of artificial penalty on on which recruitments you happen to to estimate and how they feed through so i i, I think that is beneficial 
So I, I think we probably should explain this approach a little more. I and, and maybe I'll get this wrong, but John or someone else could um, maybe correct me. Is that the in the this multi fan CL approach? The reason they had a very weak penalty was to uh, on the stock recruitment relationship, so that you would estimate the stock recruitment relationship inside the model, but it wasn't actually influencing the results, which is different than say the stock synthesis approach, where you're putting a the the penalty on the recruitment deviates because you think that those recruitment deviates have that kind of distribution so i think it's two different approaches that that people are using is that correct yeah mark i think i think that is correct you've you've characterized what we're doing um correctly i think um, and yes, I mean, our, our objective was given, given that the assessments were, you know, data rich, perhaps information poor, but at least data rich, we wanted to, <clears throat> you know, as Andre said, we wanted to rely on the data to provide information on what the population scaling was um, and, and not an assumption about the variability of the recruitment deeds. And, and we, you know, if you look at any of our likelihood profiles in our assessments, you'll see that that stock recruitment penalty component is indeed very uh, you know it's a lot flatter and and uh, much less substantial than we typically see in stock synthesis uh, assessments where you know 0.6 is often used as sigma r yeah rich I think there's probably a one point of nuance to that is that you're more worried about that penalty on the right hand side than the left because like some of it is, if it's really going up steeply as you you would decrease the I0, you'll probably see the size structure doing the same thing, the CPUE, because your size structure is collapsing, your population is collapsing, you restrict, there's a certain restriction on the freedom of the model to account for that by the recruitment bottoming out. So it's, I'm not sure it's, it's entirely ind independent of what's happening in the rest of the data, just saying that's too small. I think it's when you see that, where in theory your prior would actually give you a distribution that you could put no other data in almost and you'll still you'll still get something sensible well, sensible is the wrong one i think that's the one that's worrying when there's a a right hand side thing and it's it's really implying a distribution of its own for r zero as opposed to just that's just too small okay uh, any other topics that people want to discuss yeah Um, I have a question about the use of alpha and beta in reverting root function. So I think it's quite straightforward uh, that alpha and beta should be used when, you know, like time bearing biological parameters are considered. But uh, in a Bayesian analysis, even with time uh, invariant biological parameters, uh, um, because because of some inherent correlation between stiffness and R0, uh, as they are derived quantities of alpha and beta and some other biological parameters. So imposing some independent priors on those stiffness and R0 uh, also induces some relationships between alpha and beta. Um, I think this can be checked if you draw samples of alpha, uh, R0 and stiffness from your independent priors and transform back to alpha and beta. So, um, so does that mean that in Bayesian analysis or some model conditioning approaches, like we should use alpha and beta parameters instead of R0 and stiffness? Thanks. Does anyone want to uh, answer that question or discuss it? I guess one, one thing related to that is um, you know, you're talking about moving back to alpha and beta from steepness and R zero um, in that context and also other contexts, but that requires alpha and beta to be the right parameters in the model based on biological reasons. Is that correct? And is and is that and are those actually correct in the model? Because the the um, Bevitt and Holt and Ricker models are based on some kind of theory about constant mortality over time and things like that, which is not over time, over density. Um, 
which may not be appropriate. So I guess that's the question is, uh, is, is the current alpha and beta the actual right parameters or should be a, even be a different parameterization? So my, my question is just about, um, you know, the imposing independent prior on alpha and beta versus, you know, the independent prior on stiffness R0 could be in different result, especially in model conditional approach. Like if you sample from uh, some priors that you assume, um, and you do some model conditionings, you know, like the DB SRA approach, something like that. Um, you know, because those, you know, uh, assuming independent price on different parameterization could be in a different result. So I was just wondering, like, what kind of approaches we should take. Thanks for the clarification. Is anyone, um, Ani, do you want to comment on that? A related point. Uh, just to expand a little bit on the special case of steepness equals one, that or yeah, simply uh, no relationship between uh, spawning, stuck, and recruitment. I can see that working fine in an uh, estimation model that's just estimating the uh, population uh, status. But uh, is it right that IATTC does that for assessments? Uh, well, and maybe uh, perhaps regardless of that. Yeah, st steepness of one would, would then sort of, uh, you would have to define management objectives that are, are not based on MSY or not based on any uh, biomass that you want to stay above because recruitment uh, is, is uh, hurt uh, under, if, if the biomass goes below that, I thought it would just be, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so historically, at least the uh, IATTC has used steepness of one. Uh, with a sensitive always doing a sensitivity of 0.75 the current uh, assessments are ensemble models so we have a range of steepness with a expert derived priors um, but it's not wrong to do msy calculations on steepness of one right and in my opinion steepness of one is probably pretty good for tuna it's just we don't really go down low enough to see the reduction in recruitment, right? And so if you manage above what would be not a good place to be for other reasons anyway, you're not going to hit that steepness. But sort of to, to come back on this question, and this relates to Andre's suggestion of we should have a, you know, a unified um, set of priors for steepness or values and their weights. Has anyone seen any evidence of recruitment declining at lower biomass sizes for tuners, which wasn't due to autocorrelation or regime shifts? So that means <laughs> you look no, no response right? means steepness is one. Is that, is that what I can record in the minutes? <laughs> it, it means the shiny app is loading. Just a sec. <laughs> yeah. So related evidence, to this, absence I, of evidence is not evidence for absence, my friend. And I actually have a comment <laughs> on the prior thing. <laughs> yeah. So um, related to this, I guess a long time ago at an ISSF workshop. Uh, I think it was Shelton put together a meta-analysis of steepness for stock recruitment relationships for tuna. So is that something that should be used? Should it be updated? Should we be doing regime shift analysis? What would, Andre, since you're still here, what would be your suggested approach to come up with our prior for steepness? Okay, couple, couple of things. Um, firstly, going back to the issue of alpha and beta and steepness and, and, and R0, they definitely, was that Toshi who asked the question and then walked out the room? Um, but uh, what I'd suggest there is, uh, firstly, those aren't independent. Alpha and beta are not independent, that's correct. But what you could do quite plausibly, particularly if you're not worried about time varying parameters, is put priors on R0 and steepness and actually then just do the Jacobian to get the prior on the um on the on the other parameters. So I don't you can you can you can deal with the correlation. In terms of the priors, um I don't know if Carolina's from the West Coast, but what we've done on the West Coast is essentially 
um, not try to come up with a meta-analysis of best estimates, because as you point out, it'll be a lot of ones, uh, but really looking at what the post, you know, averaging the posteriors or synthesizing the posteriors. And, and if John's um, plot is correct um, of, of the likelihood profile, which is approximately what a posterior will look like, you're going to, you're going to conclude that You've got a lot of evidence that you don't know what you got what's going on. So your prior your your prior for steepness could be rather than your interpretation, which is that it's high. I suspect what it'll say is it's probably not low, but there's a lot of range. There's a lot of range you can't exclude. Yeah, Rich, Andres made me feel brave to answer your question, Mark. After saying that, I, I was wondering about how much to say about SPT, where there's been. De years of debate as to what that range should be and that it changes with time and and that yes the autocorrelation if you don't take account for that will tell you something that you think looks really informative but when you remove it it's not so i think most of the time we've got to the point of trying to find out what a uniform range is plausible with the data and at this point it's it's pretty broad that values above 0.8 you start to struggle for that to explain what looks like the mean recruitment thing and value values below 0.55 you start to just get stuff just bottoming out and but I, th I think it's yeah it's that is like can you come up with a plausible range and whack a uniform prior on it and I'm not sure there's much more than that that we feel brave enough to do but it changes all the time so I'm not going to pretend that's a, it's not been super consistent over time so I'm not sure what the right answer is but that's the kind of that's what the S SPT assessments tried to do. Okay. All right. So, in one <laughs> sense, we took the shepherd approach. <laughs> yeah, Carolina. Just to uh, comment on what Arnie was asking. So, we we our reference points uh, they. In, the limit reference point takes into account a smaller steepness, so it's not everything based on the letter. So that kind of like gets you in the range of the precautionary. So that's okay. Okay, any other comments or questions on recruitment? Yeah, Philippe. Yeah, th <clears throat> thanks. Um, this one's for Andre probably. Um, you suggested, I guess, more estimating more recruitment divs is probably generally better. Um, I guess one of the things that I've noticed working in length based assessments quite a bit is that we often get this sort of funny pattern that you saw in the um, in the Southern Bluefin um, rec divs that you just put up there in the very beginning, and and um, you know often get this sort of either sigmoidal shape or sort of rapid decline very early on um, when we have relatively little or poorly informative data sets and i guess one of the one of the steps that i've taken recently is essentially shifting the recruitment forward because i couldn't essentially it didn't make a lot of sense to me that there was this sort of consistent signal that wasn't really apparent you know that that didn't appear to be particularly driven by any particular data set informing that but um seemed to be more of an artifact and so i was wondering if you had any um i guess good practices or ideas of you know where or guidelines as to what to take into account when when um, deciding on you know, when to start estimating recruitment dates. I can respond if you wish, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Andre, please. Yep. So um, yes, in fact, I was teaching about recruitment yesterday, <laughs> and I did show some of those. You, you you get a whole bunch of pathological things occasionally for early devs. Things like all, you know, all, you had bad recruitment and then one year you had spectacularly good recruitment. Then you've got the what I call the bump where you've got these smooth patterns in, in rec devs, usually because you're trying to fit some um, length frequency, early length frequency. Um, but what I've also found, though, is, you know, that tends to be an over-reliance on looking at the point estimates. Once you start to look at how uncertain that is, um, and particularly within a Bayesian framework, what those those patterns actually sort of get totally discounted when you recognize that they they have a CV of 0.6 or whatever your sigma R is. Um, so um, I'm I'm usually not that concerned unless you get something truly pathological. But yes, it does require that you capture more of the uncertainty than just the the point estimates. Otherwise, people start wondering why was recruitment bad in 1943. Um, 
when really all it's saying is there was some above average recruitment, but it's usually not, not a huge rec dev anyway. Does that help? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I think that that's useful. I guess, um, I guess I'm wondering whether there's a point where, you know, you, you would, you would say, well, you know, it's, it's, it may be worth, I guess, ignoring those recruitment divs and just say, well, you know, given that they're so uncertain at that point, we might as well fix them at one, um, or whether at that point it's still worth, you know, estimating them early on. Um, well, then the response that point, is, why do you fine. even start the model back there? Yeah, it's sort well, of there, creating there information. That. Yeah, so I, I, the, the, if I was, uh, John's got his hand up, but if I would, you know, I, I advocate, if you're going to go back in time, you need to quantify uncertainty. I really detest assessments where the uncertainty increases because you suddenly have data. And I've certainly seen that, that the confidence intervals were low back in 1873, but in 1980, we suddenly got data. So we estimated rec devs and the uncertainty went up. Uh, I would suggest that that is pathological and should not happen. So either start the model later or, and don't pretend that you can estimate the past or uh, estimate the devs and, and capture the uncertainty appropriately. John is gonna disagree with everything I said. Yeah, John, you have a comment? Yeah, not not really disagree, but but uh, you know one thing we see in uh, tuner assessments that um, have long line CPUE is the abundance indices, and uh, often we see very weird things happening early in the time series, and we see these you know fairly precipitous drops in long line CPUE that um, you know can't be explained by catch removal because the catches were way too small for for that to be. You know a fishing mortality effect so the models tend to want to explain it by by having um steep declines in in recruitment um so a solution yeah andre says start the model later the other way might be just to um you know not fit to the early cpoe data in the in the long line fishery okay thanks john um yeah toshi uh, <clears throat> So my point is the so process error is very much convenient to ask the process error to explain unknown variability or unknown unknown even. So even we are estimating the sigma r nicely as I under mentioned that the status space model can provide in theory the estimation of a sigma r, but 10 years later or 20 years later, if we use the same model. Sigma R is sigma R, like 0 0.6 is 0 0.6. So unless we try to uh, understand why such variability happens, we have to face with the uh, same problem of the projection currently and or 10, 10 years later or 20 years later. So uh, are there any uh, tuna approach, a tuna species approach, uh, for example, to understand what's happened or what, what's the main driver of the uh, stochastic variation in the stock and the recruitment? So that kind of the, and maybe there are many, many candidate variable, environmental variables, which means the um, estimation is not easy, but maybe we can use some kind of the sparse modeling uh, to select the uh, main driver of the environmental covariate. That may put, uh, increase, reduce the extent of the sigma r to some extent, which may help to for the uh, quality of the projection. That's my point. So any approach happen in uh, some r modes? Yeah, does anyone have an example where they've used covariates in the, for recruitment and used it in projections? Well, I mean, we, we've tried that in the IATTC a long time ago and it didn't really work that well. And obviously there's the, the famous Myers and someone analysis that finds it and then 10 years later it disappears. And also you have to, if, if it is, for projections, you have to project the, the environmental variable, at least if you're going over more than a couple of years related to the, the age of recruitment to the fishery. Yeah. Uh, we may have to think about some way for future. Otherwise, we may have the same problem in 10 years later. So that's my point. Thank you much. OK, thanks. So any other questions or comments?
Yeah, Charles. Oh, no, sorry. Not Charles. <laughs> yeah, hello. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think a question for Andre or, or John Hampton. Uh, following up John's example of uh, trend in recruitment deviates with the skipjack assessment that having a flat CPV but increasing catches and therefore a trend of recruitment deviates, what would be the best practice to account for that when projecting? Because that will have management implication. Andre mentioned the use of bias correction for projecting in the future, but what would be the best practice? In those cases, we are facing similar case in the in the, in the ocean yellowfin, having uh, decreasing CPV, increasing catches, and therefore a increasing trend or recent trend of recruitment deviates. So, how to tackle that in the projections? Thank you. Okay, is, does anyone want to answer that question? Sean's a really smart guy. I'll leave it to him. <laughs> that is a really hard problem. <laughs> Yeah, and it, and it was basically my my question, I suppose, that I posed for the meeting. But uh, you know, I think uh, where, where we get these trends, uh, we often don't have time when doing production assessments with deadlines to fully, you know, pull them apart and 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 try and come up with reasonable interpretations as to why they might be be occurring. And we're just sort of left with having to present those to scientific committees. But I think there does need to be some dedicated research to try and, you know, better understand those. For example, you know, is this issue of uh, stationary natural mortality, is that a potential, you know, uh, area of our model that could be driving those sorts of trends? You know, now that we have this nice uh, simulation model uh, that was used for the you know, Indian Ocean Yellowfin, perhaps we can use that to investigate some of these hypotheses and, and see what might be driving those trends and what the proper modelling response to them might be when they occur. Okay, thanks, John. And I, I think it's also a, a fairly sort of broad question, a general question too, in terms of if there's trends in recruitment or other processes, when you do projections, how do you model that? Do you keep the trend going? Do you use autocorrelation? You know, do you assume constant over the last couple of years or something like that? So a fairly um, broad uh, issue that we have to deal with if we're, we're going to have to do projections, which I think we do because I had to do it for Skipjack, I think probably an MSC requirement now. Okay, so um, I think we're coming to the end of this session. Um, some of these questions might come up later on in the workshop as well. And um, I guess it looks like Quite a bit of work needs to be done, particularly coming up with the good practices in terms of developing priors for steepness, autocorrelation, sigma r, things like that for, for um, a coordinated use across the different assessments. So now we're going to move on to CPUE um, and we're going to have the um, keynote before lunch and then a comment after it and discussion after it. So Toshi is going to give us the keynote. Hello. Okay, hello. I'm Toshi Kitakato uh, from Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. I'm so glad to be a speaker with Nico uh, and commentator Lola uh, under this section. And I would like to uh, thank organizer Mark and Simon for giving us this opportunity. And as, as we have only 20 minutes for our presentation, which means 10 minutes for each, so we, have, we may not be able to go into details, but I think we can provide several uh, discussion key arena for uh, toward best practice on CPUE and its related matters. And of course, everybody here knows well that CPUE is one of the most influential factors in many stock assessment, 
So the main purpose of standardization of CPUE is to extract information on trend of the relative exploitable biomass, uh, specific to fishery by removing the potential bias factors and then apply it in the stock assessment. And furthermore, CPUE is one of the key inputs for the management procedure for internally fitting in MP and also uh, controlling the TSC with recent CPUE trend. In addition, a ship, a standardization can also contribute to knowing the spatial distribution of fish from past to current and hopefully uh, potentially for future prediction. And the main technical uh, task is to uh, distinguish temporal effects and catchability and spatial and habitat effects. And to meet such objective, there has been uh, advances in data and model structure. And also there has been another advances in statistical modeling and methods. Mm -hmm. Normally some uh, temporal effects are to be extracted in order to draw the overall abundance index by aggregating spatial factors over space. But also sometimes we implicitly assume invariant uh, selectivity and weight over space and sometimes over time too. And for further technical issues, uh, there have been uh, traditional and recent issues, and some of which have been well solved and uh, others are ongoing to resolve. And so today uh, we will split our presentation into two components. After I cover several topics shown on the, at the top left, and Nico will take over to cover special temporal modeling and case studies. And I think we will receive some question and then Laura will give uh, some complimentary uh, presentation commentary presentation for stimulating further discussion. So let me begin with the uh, joint CPUE with clustering first. And here are lots of the collaborators in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. The example here is Indian Ocean European tuna. And as you can see, effort to, of Japan and Korea have been decreasing while that of Taiwan is uh, increasing. So it seems good to supplement the lack of temporal and the spatial coverage each other to produce a joint index by integrating the information available. And the prominent work was uh, conducted by Simon and his collaborators. But this time, uh, even though there are some data access restriction, restriction uh, due to the COVID, analysis were conducted by national scientists. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, uh, one of the rationale of the joint CPUE comes from benefit of the uh, increase the coverage in the space and time to draw more varied information on the biomass trend. And the catchability might be different between fleets, but same spatial and environmental effects can be shared. And also in each country, uh, each vessel might have different strategy, so clustering of the operation seems uh, useful to account for the different target or change of target. And one more uh, ca important caveat is that selectivity must be the same or at least reasonably similar among the countries and fleet. And right figure show the time series of the nominal CPUE and mean length. And Taiwanese mean length is relatively low from 1990s to 2004. And it might be due to a problem with the data correction and measurement and some other issues. And so with such reasons, our Taiwanese data are used from 2005 in this exercise. And regarding the clustering to account for the possible change in target species in each vessel, each, each national scientist worked with the species composition for one degree grid for 10 days time unit by vessel to conduct the hierarchical clustering as shown in the middle of a dendrogram. And the number of the clusters can be automatically be determined. So in this case study, an elbow method was adopted with respect to the sum of the within cluster variation. And this figure is for the Taiwanese analysis and for Taiwanese data, and it set vessel operation for the uh, cluster two uh, targeted yellowfin mainly. Yellow is for yellow, yellowfin. And this is a, a spatial map of the decadal average uh, nominal CPUE for uh, Taiwanese data. And as you can see, cluster two is ma uh, uh, mainly targeting uh, yellowfin tuna, so there are a high CPUE. But having said that, uh, in between the period, there are some uh, decreasing uh, trend. And this is for Japan and, and for Korea. And each country has a main cluster for yellowfin. 
but some uh, other cluster may ha uh, have some signal too uh, with different level of catch. So with such pieces of clustering uh, outcomes as a categorical variables, uh, we employ the GLM approach. And the result also compared with the result with other targeting information on the Cook's between float. And but actually trend were generally uh, similar as shown in the uh, bottom left, at the bottom right figures. And the left figures uh, show the standardized, standardized GPUs uh, with and without cluster information. And the uh, cluster information uh, will work to make the uh, CPUs smoother. And right figure compared a result using data with all cluster categories and with one selected category in each country. So there are uh, uh, one uh, top uh, selected uh, cluster for each uh, uh, country uh, pre -sel uh, selected for the GLM analysis. And that could be compared with the uh, uh, analysis with all the data of the, over the four or five clusters. And it's, in this case, a single cluster may cause some variation. So it seems better to keep all the cluster categories in analysis in this case. Other as uh, the cluster uh, have uh, some signal on the biomass trend in addition to the uh, uh, main clusters. But some caveats are left, and we recognize that more careful investigation is needed to see the consistency of selectivities among fleets and or cluster by a size composition data. And so size composition can be compared by cluster in each country, and also size composition can be compared by a spatial grid. And pre, uh, let me briefly cover the one CPU related to the issues on assessment uh, diagnostics with CPUE. And the validation of assessment model might be covered later agenda by Felipe and Jim in this workshop, but let me click. Uh, there is a technique for evaluating consistency and the predictability of assessment model as an extension of routine uh, retrospective analysis. And in this method, a biomass estimate uh, until the most recent year, estimated by full model and forecasted by retrospectively uh, compared using same model assumption. And this is so-called uh, model-dependent evaluation because of uh, both full, both uh, full and retro uh, results are dependent on the model. But if we compare the predicted CPUE with observed CPUE in the, using the same retrospective manner, it can be model-free evaluation as a kind of retrospective cross validation with data. And this is an example of such retrospective cross validation for Atlantic Big Eye Tuna. And by removing the three and five and 10 years data, all the models shown here have less prediction scale, which means uh, uh, partly a limit of the models or difficulty in the prediction by models with the process errors. Or but, uh, another possibility is a structural changes like a change in selectivity or even effort cleave in fishery that have, that have been missed. So there might be some constellations through the uh, uh, kind of the uh, retrospective uh, cross validation through CPUE to understand what happened. And one more point before passing to the uh, uh, NICO, uh, which is the age and size based of CPUEs. And again, this is a formula for CPUE in space, time, and fleet. And fish availability by age or size might be different over space. So we may be able to consider a spatial temporal model by age, size, or life stage. And this important idea is summarized in Mark's paper published in 2020. But please allow me to introduce my uh, Japanese colleague's paper. And Sato-san analyzed the EPO big eye data using BUST with three different size categories for juvenile, intermediate, and adult. <clears throat> and analysis uh, drew different use of space by life stages and its uh, interannual change over time. And this sort of applicate approach might be useful uh, to give a proxy of age-based CPUEs and to resolve the problems from the spatial difference of the resource uh, availability. And this is my last slide. Uh, so I think that Nico will nicely address some topics related to spatial temporal modeling, but I'd like to raise a few issues. And there are some merits for the possible uh, to account for the temporal change in the spatial distribution. And also the uh, Gaussian Markov random field can handle with the data in the location with no or little data 
and also possible to analyze the data in whole study area, which means uh, we can assume the uh, single queue without uh, using a different queue over space. And outcomes might be useful for the post stratification. But the other issue is the first one is the regarding the effect of spatial distribution, a difference in selectivity or vulnerability. The internal uh, smoothing and auto creation in space and time in, uh, in uh, usual space uh, spatial temporal model is basically intended to account for the spatial and temporal variation in fish density. But I think the current approach includes smoothing together between density and selectivity. So, uh, so that mi mixing the two issues into one uh, for the smoothing. Uh, so there might be some uh, cause of a gap of smoothness. And also related to the, uh, this uh, issue, uh, normally spatial temporal model assume the common SPD parameter as to, uh, and also odd creation, but there might be some difference over space and time. So better to know uh, such difference gives impact to the uh, extended uh, extracted time series of abundance as an index or not. So maybe a good time to switch to the ECO for uh, handling the, uh, issuing the uh, spatial temporal modeling. Thank you, Toshi-san. Yep. Um, so I'll be going into a little bit more detail on spatial temporal models, just because as modeling tools have become more sophisticated, these have become a lot easier to use, and we're seeing a lot more applications of these in, in fisheries, but also specifically tuna fisheries. However, uh, we're fitting to fisheries dependent data, so there are definitely some issues that remain when, when fitting to this data. So I'm gonna talk uh, more specifically about uh, WCPO yellowfin tuna, but these are general problems that exist um, for all fisheries dependent data. So quickly to start up the case study, uh, the 2020 uh, WCPO yellowfin tuna uh, used a spatial temporal model, uh, VAST, analyzing specific wide operational data uh, to develop indices um, from 1952 to 2018. And the general structure of that assessment model was uh, temporal fixed effect, spatial and spatial temporal random effects, a country or flag effect, and then a uh, cubic spline on hooks between the floats. Um, and this resulted in regional indices that were quite similar to the uh, region specific delta GLMs that were used in the, the previous assessment. There was recently a, a Yellowfin peer review. Um, and this identified a couple uh, problem areas, um, potential problem areas with uh, these indices. One was the, the relative scaling of biomass between regions, um, particularly the equatorial regions were thought to be a bit low compared to the temperate regions. And there was also concerns and questions with how the model dealt with unsampled or poorly sampled areas, particularly around the, the fringes of that distribution. Um, so I actually focus a little bit more on, on these issues. Um, so thinking about how these regional indices are actually calculated, um, it's the sum of biomass within, uh, predicted biomass within each of these regions, um, area, uh, product of area and density. And so depending on what that model structure is, it common, that density is commonly a linear combination of your, your, uh, your temporal main effect, your spatial or spatial temporal random effects, and also any environmental covariates that you've included on um, density. So how does this change? How does predictions, uh, how do predictions of density change as your, your sampling changes and perhaps your model structure? Well, if you've got good uh, comprehensive spatial temporal sampling, all of these different components are going to be feeding into your estimate of density. Um, and if you're modeling at the correct spatial resolution, if you're explaining more and more of that environmental variance or variation with the environmental covariate, your spatial and spatial temporal random effects um, should tend towards uh, zero. If you have inadequate spatial coverage, um, those spatial and spatial temporal random effects will have less, um, they'll have less influence on this particular area of density um, as the nearest neighbor distance with your, your next closest observation increases. Um, and since Gaussian Markov random fields are, are typically zero centered in these models, so that effect will go to zero um, and they'll fall out of this uh, density um, uh, prediction. If you don't have an environmental covariate, um, 
this can cause meaningful change in your index scale if you don't really have any nearest neighbors to inform um, the prediction otherwise, and if the proportion of cells in that area that don't have any information otherwise is high. And so the decision on how to model environmental covariates uh, is an important one. And if you're in the worst possible scenario where you're not necessarily including an environmental covariate and you don't have adequate spatial coverage, particularly around the edges of a distribution, this is perhaps emblematic of what was seen in uh, the Yellowfin case, you're really just filling in those unsampled areas with your temporal main effect because you don't have any environmental information to inform it and those spatial random effects are, are going to zero because they don't have um, any nearest neighbors to inform it. So how to deal with some of these unsampled areas. Uh, the first thing is to understand why there's a gap in your spatial temporal sampling. Um, so fishers sample preferentially, they're unlikely to spend a lot of time fishing where there aren't any fish. Um, so is that low sampling due to low abundance? And furthermore, is that, is that low abundance simply because the habitat's not good, the environmental conditions aren't good, or there's actually localized depletion going on? Um, other reasons for why there may be a gap in spatial uh, sampling is economic, uh, social, or regulatory drivers. And so stepping through um, possible solutions. Um, I've highlighted in, in green ones that are, are currently feasible. Um, if you've identified that the, the gap in spatial coverage is likely due to the insuitability of habitat, then you can simply just redefine your spatial domain to exclude those areas um, from your model and your index calculation. If another thing that you can do is if maybe seasonally uh, some cells are viable, maybe as temperature fluctuates, you can impose a, a time dynamic environmental sensor um, to include or exclude uh, some of those cells from your index calculation. It's important though, if you're doing uh, a sensor like this, that this is based um, as much as possible on maybe external biological analyses or physiological analyses of the, the species environmental envelope, rather than informing that solely on the fisheries dependent data, just because there are biases associated with drawing inference solely from fisheries dependent data. Um, it's also worth noting that, oh, next. Something else that could be done is just simply adding an environmental covariate into the model. Important though, that again, you, you check to see that the estimated relationship that you're getting with the environmental covariate and density makes sense with what you know from other studies. Um, that isn't just, chasing noise. Probably should have put another check here that this can help in some cases uh, fill in gaps caused by external factors. So I think, so that's kind of what's easy to do now or easier to do now. I think where we are and kind of the, the advancing front of CPU research is this idea of uh, preferential sampling models. And unfortunately, I think it needs a lot more attention than the time I'm going to give it. Um, and Craig Marsh has done a lot of really good work specifically as preferential sampling relates to CPUE. Um, so he's probably the better person to ask about this, but it's essentially modeling, jointly modeling the probability of, of choosing a specific location as a function of, of density, and then also uh, modeling the CPUE in, within the same model. And this is needed to correct for that fisheries dependent data. And so this can be used for, for the localized depletion case as well as the not suitable habitat case. And I think where CPUE standardization, particularly spatial CPUE standardization is going into the future is borrowing from fisheries economics to more fully model uh, the discrete choice that fishers make in selecting a different thing, uh, different sites. And so this is, is extending that preferential sampling model um, and, and trying to build in maybe distance from shore into the reasons why they're choosing to, to fish in certain areas. I haven't fully formulated how this might work, but I think that's an idea of, of where we should be going um, down the line. So some, some good practices and additional considerations. Um, not all model covariates are created equally. Um, some modeling platforms force you to distinguish between density and catchability covariates. Uh, VAST does that. Uh, SDM-TMB and MGCV do not. 
Um, however, even if the model doesn't force you to do it, you should specifically identify how you're treating um, each of the different uh, covariates in your model. Um, when modeling regional indices, we typically think of that spatial effect as impacting density. Um, it's also possible that there are spatial interactions with catchability covariates. Uh, the example that I put up there, um, oftentimes bird radar is used for school detection. This might actually be more useful in, in the high latitudes where there are more birds. And so the temporal, the, the catchability, covariate, uh, catchability effect of bird radar may have um, some spatial confounding in it. Additionally, as uh, was mentioned earlier, um, these spatial temporal analyses typically assume stationarity in the spatial correlation structures. And so it's probably a, a good practice to check to see if that's a valid assumption to make. So setting up sub-regional models to see if those estimated correlation structures are consistent with the basin scale analysis, and also looking to see if the indices that are produced are consistent as well. And lastly, um, as it relates to understanding the, uh, the how the gaps in spatial coverage are uh, created, it's really important to have a good understanding of the fishery, um, the effort expansions, contractions, uh, management measures that might impact that, and uh, talking to actual fishers is, is helpful in this process. Um, so that should probably be best practice in, in CPU standardization. And I will close with not my thoughts, but something else's thoughts. Um, yeah, I talked with a machine for about an hour and it was weird. Um, the fine, the details are a bit of a word salad, but I thought it very interesting that it pulled out some rather sensible big ideas as it relates to uh, spatial CPUE standardization. Um, so yeah, that's where I will leave it. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Toshi. Okay. Do we have any uh, questions? Um, yes, I know. A good idea to talk to chat GPT. You can ask it for citations as well, and it, and it makes them up. <laughs> they, look, they look real, but they're completely fabricated. Um, I had a question about that issue of covariates varying in space, um, which is a really interesting point, because um, when we do the standardizations for longliners um, by region, we do get, for example, HBF covariates varying in space. Um, I just wondered where you see this, the, like the large um, spatiotemporal models going, whether it might be better to uh, maybe do those in separate areas or whether there's the capability to have parameters varying in space, uh, but then you're getting to a lot of parameters to estimate, it gets pretty, uh, it's pretty slow as it is. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, I think the first part depends on how you want to use your indices. If you need, if you're doing a spatial model and you need the joint analysis to create regional indices that preserve regional scale and then use that to inform the regional scaling in the model, I think you're, if you're choosing to use CPUE for that, I think you're kind of stuck with the basin level or maybe not stuck with it, but that's one way of doing it. If you don't use, if you're not doing a spatial model and or you're not trying to impose regional weights using the CPUE, then you, yeah, I think you can do those sub-regional models and still get what you need. Um, if you need to do a basin scale model and you have concerns about uh, the relation, the, the spatial interaction with the catchability covariate, uh, this is something that Laura and I discussed um, a couple weeks ago is, do you want to put in a, like a blocky interaction? Because that could then create its own problems um, 
if you have these discontinuities in your, in your surface as you jump from one uh, catchability to another. And something that came up in that discussion was maybe there's a way to proxy spatial structure using, uh, or that spatial interaction using a continuous covariate so that it's, it's a little bit smoother of a transition and the model might have an easier time uh, estimating that. I mean, these are, these are just ideas, they're theories, they haven't actually been tested in practice, but it, it should be, a, you should be able to set up a simulation to, to definitive or more definitively answer that question. Any other questions? Yeah, Carolina. So uh, some of the density covariates might vary uh, dynamically over time. So they, they have it to may expand and contract. So how do you suggest we, we take that into account into when we compute the, the indices? Yeah, I think if you've got an idea, this might not be the best um, example, but for something like the warm pool, if as it grows and, and shrinks, um, you and you've got a really strong relationship between that and your your stock. And again, this is going to be case by case, depending on on the relationship with each stock and the environmental covariates. But I think the idea of a I guess dynamic uh, spatial domain, if it's if um, if you have a really clear link with an environmental um, variable, I think is a reasonable one to make. Um, you just have to be careful that it's not something else that's that's doing it. It's not fishery contraction or or depletion that's causing you to have that different signal. Um, John Hampton, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Nicholas, I, I um, wonder how much of the spatial variability might be due to things like the interaction of hooks between floats and um, the thermal structure, vertical structure of the water column. Um, are we able to take into account things like that? I, I know the data record is a little bit disjointed or, or certainly not complete for documenting hooks between floats. But I think there is pretty good information available now on vertical structure of the ocean from different uh, global oceanographic models. And it might be useful to try and incorporate some of that into these models. Yeah, thank you for that comment, John. And I'm actually really glad that you brought, brought that up because that's that's an oversight in this in this presentation. There's actually, well, there's there's a paper that I really like that you and Keith did, I think in 2002, where you took more of an empirical look at um, CPUE standardization by taking into account the depth of hooks and also the um, the oxygen minimum zone. So the the I guess the available vertical habitat for big eye in the Western and Central Pacific. Um, and I think, as you say, as we, as we have more information about uh, fishing depth for some of these different gears and more information on what that available vertical habitat might look like um, from more recent studies and, and have the ability to incorporate um, more comprehensive remote sensing data, revisiting um, that 2002 analysis, I think, is, is probably pretty reasonable. It's something that if I have more time, I would like to try to do. So any response to that, Dan? I oh, know. Yeah, John, do you want to respond to that or? Um, no, uh, not specifically, just to, yeah, give a tick to Nicol Nicola's idea that, um, yeah, revisiting that, um, you know, habitat-based standardization stuff um, might be might be useful. Uh, there's undoubtedly more information available for that sort of thing now than there was in the early 2000s. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to follow up on that, and this, I'm going to look towards the Alaska Science Center people in the room, or the Northwest Center people in the room, if they're here. Um, 
but I believe Jim Thorson might be playing with a three-dimensional or a postdoc up there is playing around with a three-dimensional uh, model where they're actually taking in the, the water column um, availability. I could be completely fabricating that, but I, I think that's something that's happening. Um, so different species, but that could eventually make its way into, into the tuna stuff as that becomes more refined. Yeah. So a comment on that. I think it might be Kelly Johnson who's doing that. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but yeah, we, we looked into that a lot um, uh, 20 years ago or whatever. And the one of the things that we ran into is that the depth of the hooks didn't follow the, the theory. So um, hopefully now there's been a lot more uh, uh, information collected on where how deep the, the hooks fish given currents and all that sort of stuff. So. Um, yeah, you might be able to do a better job now than, than we could back then, yeah. Okay, so I think we should move on. Um, it's lunchtime and we're going to have discussion after the comment after lunch, so we'll have a lot more time to discuss this if, if we want to bring it up again. So thanks everyone and back at half past one.